welcome back. Today we have part two of my interview with Paul Eiding. So without further ado, let's go. 100%. So speaking of live action, I've brought up Star Trek a couple times. You've been on Star Trek. <laughs> what do you remember what about you those? Hey, what do you remember yeah, about sure those experiences? <laughs> I, I sure did. And what's, what's really lovely is that uh, when people uh, remember the episode, I only did one. Mm -hmm. I only did the one time uh, um, and had a heck of a lot of fun. But it always, it, it, well, like I said, it always surprises me somebody remembers something I did. <laughs> they remember the show. Right. Um, it, liaisons. I even just say the name of it. It's happened a couple of times where I've just said, well, oh, you're on Star Trek? Because I've got this Star Trek pen that uh -huh. the guys from Roddenberry gave me. Oh, cool. I was going to, um, uh, where was I? It was down to San Diego Comic-Con. And I'm on the train going down to San Diego. And I'm sitting in the, um, uh, across these guys. And we start talking. And they were with Roddenberry uh, wow. Company. And, they, and this one guy recognized me. And he said, you did uh, TNG? I said, yeah. He said, and then he remembered the episodes. He talked about it. And uh, he said, "Oh man, I love the show. You got to, you got to come by uh, our booth when, uh, when you, when we get down there." He said, "I want to give you something." So I said, "Oh, okay." So I went over there. He came over, and I signed something for him. And then I went over to them, and they gave me uh, um, the medal of Star Trek, the one that that's for uh, next generation. So I, I wear that on my uh, vest. I don't have it here in front of me. Yeah, it's not even in the other room. So I've got it. I, I keep it on my vest. I've got one vest that I wear all the time with that one. And then the other vest that I wear, I've got uh, my uh, Transformers <laughs> pins uh, that I've been given. Because um, it's like, it, 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 they mean a lot to me, you know? Different vests for different conventions. <laughs> or just day, day right. to day. One's a little heavier than the other one on but, uh, a little colder day. <laughs> so, so how was it working with that crew of actors? Cause they themselves have become legendary in sci-fi fantasy annals, you know, and I, I'm betting when you were on there, you had no idea one that decades later, people were going to say, Hey, you, you were in that episode. <laughs> well, I knew that I, I knew that I was, uh, I knew that Star Trek was a big deal that I knew at this point, you know, because it was the last season. No, no, no. It wasn't the last season. Sixth season. Mm -hmm. They had used every other actor, and then they were stuck, so they had to find somebody. So they <laughs> asked me to do uh, Ambassador Lequel. Uh, <laughs> so I knew Star Trek was going to be around, for, but I had no idea how big. You know, mm -hmm. you never do. Right. Um, so it was, it, was, it was great. And the biggest thing for me was meeting Picard. I mean, wow. that was, that was so cool. That was pretty cool. You know, um, working with Marina was wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's, that wasn't a hard job. You know, I get to hang out with Marina. <laughs> you didn't suffer time. so. <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, but uh, meeting, meeting him, that was a big deal for me. It's like, okay, now just be cool. You're an actor here. You're, you're a peer. You're right here with him. But I was, I've been in love with him since a show that nobody remembers because it was only on PBS many, many years ago um, uh, called, oh God, we went, Oct oh Jesus, it'll come to me, um, about uh, uh, Colleen. Oh, I thought my wife was in the other room, but she's not. Um, about the Roman Empire. Oh, geez. And about, it doesn't matter. This is early on in his career then, I imagine, yeah? Oh, he was probably in his 20s when he did it. Uh, because it was on, originally I think it was on in the 70s on PBS. Um, Oct... Oh God, Oct not, not Octavius. It's um, it was about um, a guy who stuttered and had some some. Problems.
problems physically and uh, every English actor of the uh, time ended up being on it. It was an incredible series um, and he was in it. Um, he was apparently in a lot of, <laughs> uh, I, I Claudius was a miniseries. I Claudius. Is that it? Okay. I Claudius. Every, uh, every English actor of, of note was in that thing and he was in it. I ended, I think he ended up getting killed. So I, and I, he was, he really hit you then. And he had a lot of hair too, uh, <laughs> uh, but he was wonderful on the, on the show. So I've been a fan forever. Mm -hmm. And then to meet him was like, okay, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, and I don't get, I've worked with some big names and I, I don't get awed by many people, but I was by him. Uh, and he was just, how you doing? Nice to have you here. Uh, it was great. I had a great time working on the show. Um, Marina was was lovely. Um, hey, I got they paid me to eat chocolate <laughs> and have desserts and play games. Um, and you know, I I couldn't get upset about anything. Uh, you know, the nope. tough, toughest thing was having a couple of hours to put on the makeup in the morning. Right. Um, the, put on the forehead and all the hair. At the, the, it's very funny when we finished the show, when I took off uh, the last day, when I took off my my fake forehead, I kept it. Oh, wow! I was going to yeah, I was going to use it for Halloween. <laughs> I was going to put it back on for Halloween, <laughs> but I put it in a safe place, and I couldn't find it. Oh, and I found it about ten years later. No kidding. I'm not kidding. Wow. And what had been this sh shape ended up being that shape. Oh, know? it like dried out, right? <laughs> sure. Silicone or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> totally dried out. <laughs> yeah. There is some collector out there who would probably pay a lot of money for that, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> They'd have to dig it out of the trash. It's you know, it, it was funny as a as a kid who watched Next Gen back in the day uh, and who was a huge Transformers fan. Uh, the first Michael Bell was on the first episode of next gen yeah and i remember i didn't know what he looked like at the time but as soon as i heard his voice i said that's prowl oh, i love that i love <laughs> and that and then when you were on next gen i said hey they got another transformers guy. like that's that was my perspective they got another transformers guy oh very cool <laughs> that's very cool <laughs> so fast forwarding to more present day uh well almost present day because you did this years ago um i discovered uh the fallout franchise during the pandemic uh we were all in lockdown right and i said let me go try a new video game and um fallout 4 was on sale in the playstation store so i said oh you know i hadn't been able to get into the previous fallout games you had been in fallout 3 uh, right. I, I can't get a copy of that <laughs> to save my life under a hundred dollars so i said wow. fallout 4 is on sale for 20 bucks let me just grab that download it it literally got me through so much of the pandemic lockdown because it's such an absorbing game right yeah. and part of that is the voice acting and um uh, when and the vault tech rep who you play uh it appears right at the beginning pretty much and as yeah. soon as i heard the voice i said wait a minute <laughs> you know my, my ear went I know that voice, but you were you were kind of playing a heightened version of your normal voice, right? This this sales guy, you know, you were kind of putting on this sales guy routine a bit. Uh, yeah. So I looked it up and I said, "That's him." I knew that was, him. <laughs> you know, and um, and then it was retroactively I discovered that you've done other voices in Fallout, so I didn't realize you were such a part of that universe. Uh, could you talk a little bit about being part of the Fallout universe and being Vault Tech rep guy and so on? Yeah, sure. Um... I first did uh, vault tech uh, I, no I did uh, three Fallout three and I think I did 14 or 15 different characters in that one um, and and it was it was funny because uh, I, I said you, you want me to do this character too this this guy over here at the at the gate and you're Father, was it Father Birch or Tree Father Birch or something or Nathan? Uh, all these different characters. I said, okay, well, 
you want a different voice for these guys? I said, no, we're just we're looking for a different attitude. That'll that'll be enough. It'll change things. So so I did all these things. And my agent is the one who, who told me, said, you know, if they if you'd done a different voice for each one, they would have had to pay you a lot more. Oh, <laughs> really? Oh, yeah, because you're you're allowed to do, I think, three voices. Uh, and then after that, they have to bump you and pay you more for each oh. additional voice. But saying, you know, no, we want this basically the same voice, just have a different attitude. And they would put the different voices <laughs> in the different characters. I said, oh, that was very smart of them. That was. Uh, uh, but I love working with them because they're also folks that never, some of the companies uh, back when we were doing that, some of the companies would, would, you know, keep you until you bled, you know, you know, with yelling or screaming or whatever. They never did that. They were always very um, cognizant of of protecting you. Mm. So I love these guys, uh, the Bethesda folks. And when I did, um, I didn't audition for Fallout Four. Um, I got the call that they wanted me to come in and record something. Um, but I had to, sh I had to shave my beard. I, I just oh. had a goatee at the time because they were doing mo uh, mocap just oh, okay. facial mocap. So I said, okay. So uh, I go in, I had no idea what it was. And um, they didn't have a picture of the guy. They just said, here's what we're thinking. We're thinking of an, um, a 50s door-to-door -door vacuum cleaner salesman kind of guy what what would you come up with that for that and that's where i that's where the voice came from it's, it's just that you know, always smile hi there good morning vault tech calling good morning vault you know no sir i'm not trying to tell you anything no it's all about you you know that kind of thing um and they said cool so uh, on the screen ahead of me you can see this uh, blob form uh, we couldn't even tell what it was yet, um, but they went, you know, just to get all the mocap stuff, they, and to, you could watch what looked like a mouth moving, and you had to do all the facial stuff, you know, to make it, you know, see if it's working, and it all did, and then we went ahead and recorded, you know, I had no idea what it was for, I had no <laughs> idea, uh, that is for the the uh, Fallout uh, franchise or anything. And they just no, had me come in and do it because no, nobody wants to talk about anything that they're doing. Right. <laughs> you know. So spoiler alert for a seven year old game, but uh, Vault Tech Rep goes through kind of a transition, right, in the game, and then later on we find him in the future. And the voice was very different. It was a grumbly voice. Yeah. So yeah. did you? So you had to do that raspy thing the That's whole time. Was that tough? That's me. Oof. Yeah. And then, then I, I did another character called um, uh, Arlen Glass. Yes. Wait a second. Don't go away. Yep. Are you here? Where is it? Sorry about that. I want to oh, show no you. Where is it? Where is it? Here's. There you go. Ah, oh, so cool. Yes. There's there the Vault Tech is. rep on the other side. Then the Vault Vault Tech rep who, who becomes a, a ghoul. <laughs> and the next one is Arlen Glass, who is also a ghoul, but he has a little higher voice. Yes. And then, eh, then there's me. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, Arlen Glass, that storyline just broke my heart. Oh God, yes. Um, you and you know, the ghouls all in the game, all even played by different actors. You all have to do that kind of raspy thing, right? Male and female. Yeah. Um, and I imagine I always found as I listened to the game that it must have been extra challenging, right? Because you're doing the rasp. But there is a big difference. Now, both figures, Arlen and the Voltec rep, are tragic figures, but they're tragic in slightly different ways, right? I don't think Voltec rep had the whole child loss storyline behind no. him and the regret, right? He, he, 
he just had to slog through 200 years of hell, which is its own tragedy. Um, but I know yeah, actually, played, they didn't let him in. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and then when he, but when you played Arlen, I noticed there was this extra sadness and heaviness to the voice. The pitch was different, yes, but you also, I feel like there's an extra layer of emotional weight there. And, and that's, that's an accomplishment, I think. Well, I'm, I'm really, that's really lovely for you to say that, that you, you got that because, yeah, he, he, uh, he's a guy who worked too much, really knows that he should have been more with his family. And, and then to, for the player to bring him, um, the sound of his daughter that he hasn't heard in, 200 years it's like oh my god and you know he, he tried to get home but too late so those missed opportunities you know those that obviously he has dealt he's been um suffering with from the guilt for all, for all that time you know and yeah, that was really relatable isn't it in in our very work obsessed world right oh. where people are literally sleeping in in their jobs at, in japan right um I, I found that very relatable and, and here he is this head of this very uh successful company you know making billions and billions of dollars but that he's not happy yeah you know and, and there's a definite message there yeah big time and look you know I'm, I'm also the father of two daughters and uh um the idea, yeah, of not being there for my daughter. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a guy who didn't, I didn't have a father, you know, I was, uh, and the idea, so it was easy for me to get to that point. Sure, sure. I did a great yeah, I, I did an episode of, uh, um, this is live action, but I did an episode of uh, Grey's Anatomy. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a very heavy duty scene where the love of my life is dying. And as she's dying, she's interviewing women to be, uh, to take her place, to be my lover when she's gone. And it's like, and I'm watching her in the bed and I'm telling my, my best friend that there's no, no one can replace her. It's like, it, it and then I have, to, I lose it. I, yep. I end up sobbing. Um, and they ask, you know, and I it had to do it several times to move the cameras here and move the camera there and reshoot and reshoot. And instead of just picking up little bits and pieces, it wasn't a long scene. Um, the director very wisely said, Paul, do you want to just pick up, up or, or do you want to, what do you want to do? And I said, oh, I want to do the whole thing. And she said, good, good. So we did the whole thing. And each time, all I had to do was, in my head, place my wife or my daughters in that bed instead of this actress who I didn't know. I didn't even meet her because she was on the other side of the glass. She, she was already over there uh, So because we were shooting through the, the in, uh, intensive care unit. Uh, so I never even met her. Uh, but it wasn't necessary. I, I, I had my family there, you know. Yeah, the material was good. You found a way in yourself that well I mentioned earlier to pull from, right? And yeah. and, and that's that's one of the things I think that's not easy to do for acting because, as you mentioned, you probably had to do it what four or five times at least. Five I times. imagine uh, maybe someone could fake that once for a YouTube video or something, but imagine having to do that on cue over and over and over. Um, I remember reading one of uh, I think on Next Generation and maybe even the original Star Trek. Uh, cast members have talked about having 12 to 16 hour days on set and emotionally and you know just psychologically you've got to be drained after a while uh, yeah. pulling performances like that and you know it's funny because we started this talk about fallout which is a video game and people tend to think of video games just as pew pew right oh. but the, to me the most engaging games are the ones where I feel something for a character um, and I think Fallout manages that. Um, obviously, Metal Gear <laughs> succeeded in a very different way <laughs> for a lot yeah. of heads. Um, and there's something special about that. And I think your career, having 
touched, you know, live action, film, you know, uh, voice work, commercial. You've been all over the spectrum. Uh, and But I haven't heard, as we've been talking, any particular preference. It sounds to me like you're good just kind of going from format to format. Is that right? Um, okay, to be honest, my preference um, um, would be would be still would be stage mm -hmm. because that belongs solely to the actor. Sure, the director it depends on the material and the director helping you to get to your get to where you want to be. But that's the actor's medium. Because once you're on that stage, it's yours. It belongs to the actors in the audience. It's no longer the writers or the, uh, the, or the directors. Uh, TV is more, belongs more to the, uh, to the producers. TV and film, uh, an editor, a good editor can make you look really good or can make you look bad, uh, depending on where they cut the scene, how long they let, let something linger. So your performance uh, depends more on uh, and how it's shot. Uh, uh, you know, if, do they have a real bad angle of you or a good angle? You know what I mean? All those, there are a lot more things uh, that are in and into it. Voiceover wise, um, the, I, love, I love voiceover because I can be anything, you know? Uh, I'm only limited by my talent. Uh, doesn't matter how tall, short, fat, skinny, old, young, although old, it does, um, there is some ageism mm. happening in voiceover, like, like on camera all the time. Mm. Um, you get to a certain age and there are some companies that don't even want to can think about you. Doesn't matter that uh, the Dawes Butler in his mid seventies was doing Elroy right. on the Jetsons. Uh, but you don't get called in for certain things because, well, they, you know, maybe, maybe that voice doesn't work anymore. Well, mm. at least get the audition. But that's, that's, that's in this business. Uh, that sort of thing happens all the time. So that's nothing new there. Um, so voiceover is probably closest to being belonging to the actor as, a, as on camera, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but on camera, the pressure is on. Sure. And I like that. I like that, um, you know, uh, there isn't, like you said, there's no second take. <laughs> you're there, you're there, baby. I, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. I, 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 my only experience with acting, I did a, a, an acting class, like a junior high school. I was in a couple plays um, and I, remember a very specific energy coming off of having 200 people live watching you do something versus recording like a voiceover for a YouTube video now, right? And I mean, that's such a alone activity in many respects. You, when you put it out into the world, you have no idea who's looking at it. But when you have an audience in front of you and you've got all these people staring at you and they're waiting for you to entertain them, they're there for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. um, I just imagine that's so different than anything else, uh, film, voiceover, acting, anything like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now on the set, you'll have people around um, watching you and whatnot, but some of those people are, you know, uh, they're picking their nose, waiting to <laughs> for the table or they're you know, over here or they're at the craft uh, table get, getting something to eat. Uh, so you do have an audience. Um, yeah, but there's nothing like a live audience. Yeah, there's nothing like it. You know, you. Uh, that's why I'm always telling people go to live theater. You know, even even okay live theater is better than a lot of stuff we watch on on television. Better than a lot of stuff that I've been, done on television. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. because there's that there's that energy. There's that. Oh yeah. There's that. There's that moment in time that will never happen again. It's just you on the stage and the folks in the audience share the breath, share share everything that that and, you know the electrons and everything that's floating around the in whatever there will never be there again. Um, 
and there's an excitement to that you know um, sometimes it's, it can be dreadful sometimes it can be heavenly I, but it's definitely a moment i've been know? very fortunate that any live action i've ever seen has been in the heavenly category um uh, we were talking about uh, Sir Patrick Stewart before. Uh, years ago, during the Next Gen era, I got to see him do his One Man Christmas Carol, which was oh, wonderful. Oh. And more recently, I a uh, few years back before the pandemic, I saw him and Ian McKellen doing Waiting for Godot, which was oh, you saw it amazing. Oh. Yes, such a performance, <laughs> and that energy between uh, them being on stage and the audience uh, reacting. To, to the acting because there is a there are laughs in that play mm. and when the audience just laughs with you uh, I oh, I could only imagine they were feeding off of that it was this wonderful feedback loop between the actors and the audience well there's there's a an old saying uh, theater saying and I believe it totally that the audience gets the performance they deserve mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which means if the audience is there and really ready um, and you are fed. It's not mm -hmm. like you're trying to do anything more or you're not overacting or you're not doing anything more than you want, but you, you feel that, mm -hmm. you feel that and you give it back and, and it's reciprocated, you know? It's a wonderful the thing. The audience is just like not involved. <laughs> it's, not, it's not like you're not trying your best. Mm -hmm. it, just, it just isn't shared. Correct. And, and th there's a loss of that communal experience yeah. uh, in that scenario. Yeah. Um, so let, let's let's go to something you did more recently. Wait, wait, one more thing. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. Sure. Which is also one of the reasons why I love conventions. Ah, yeah. Not because of the um, the accolation. Oh, the the, the uh, you know the accolades and oh, I love your work. I love you. <laughs> oh, that's great. God knows we thrive on it. That's what actors thrive on. <laughs> but to to actually hear. Um, that you've you've had an effect on someone yeah you know that when you're in with a live audience yes. you know what effect you're having uh and you don't know that when you're you know you're you're doing you know cartoons or live action tv or film but when you get a chance to meet people that's when uh that's when you come alive well I, so that's I, why I, I love them i remember and i was one of these fans uh when you were at botcon uh I, I didn't see you at the panel first. You had just walked into the lobby and I was standing, I just happened to be there at the same time. And, and I saw you and I came up and I said, hi, and we chatted a little bit. And I know other fans did the same. Uh, that's, that's all, it's similar, but it's a different experience than the theater in that they're not giving you feedback on something you're doing at the moment. They're giving you feedback on something you did in the past. Again, that piece of art you put out into the world. And all of a sudden now you're getting that feedback and it's pure in, in, in many respects. And that's why mm -hmm. I've always loved seeing voice actors such as yourself at BotCon getting that immediate feedback uh, or that, that, well, retroactive, I guess, feedback yeah. from the fans, because I don't think you guys ever got to hear that in the eighties or the nineties, you know, um, even your work, like say on more recent, well, quote unquote, recent stuff like Ben 10, right. I mean, until conventions, I, I'm not sure you ever got that kind of feedback in, no. from anywhere. Uh, no. And I'm so happy for you guys to get that because I think, you know, uh, whether it's Transformers or Ben 10 or, or, or Metal Gear or Fallout, uh, the work you and, and your colleagues have done is such an important part of so many people's childhood. Um, I think people like me who feel that way, one of the things we just want to do as fans is express that. And I think conventions are a big venue for that expression. It's lovely and it's humbling. Mm -hmm. It truly is. It's like, oh. and um, I know at one point I said, I said something that I've I've been sorry I, the way I phrased it, because uh, there are some people who are fans of the work who are now dear friends mm -hmm. who have never let me forget the way I said it. <laughs> and I'm talking about a couple, a couple of friends from the UK. Uh, <laughs> I said. Well, that all an actor wants to do is to touch someone. Uh huh. I say, oh, oh, oh you're touching me. <laughs> like, oh, man. This is, and uh, Tori, uh, <laughs> who's, who's brought me over to the UK a couple of times, has never let me forget how I phrased that. It's like, okay. <laughs> but I said, you know what I meant. There, you know there what has I mean? been worse phrasing in the history of conventions. <laughs> <laughs> 
um, now, something you did during the, I think it was during the pandemic, was a short film called Frank and Emmett. Um, I, I, and I remember you put up, I think you put up a still image of it first uh, on your feed and so on. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. Then I tried to Google where I could watch it. <laughs> I couldn't find anything. And I'm so glad you gave me a look into it before we chatted. Uh, I thought it was wonderful. Uh, I thought it was very melancholy. It was beautifully shot. Um, and and uh, the puppet work was fantastic. You know, it evoked, uh, I was going to say the Muppets, but that's actually not accurate. To me, it more evoked Sesame Street. And there, the, the puppetry is a little different between the two. You know, I think Muppets aims towards more drama, uh, comedy, and so on, action sometimes. I think Sesame Street is looking to touch hearts and minds a little more, right, on a, a, at a very primal child level, which makes sense for the program. Uh, and I saw all that in there as well. This was so, you know, whoever did the puppetry, and I was going to ask you about that, uh, definitely studied very hard before they, before they went into it. Uh, so where did that come from? It, it kind of just seemed to come out of left field, especially considering when you filmed it. Yeah. Um, when I was doing, uh, the last thing I did before the pandemic hit was uh, Shakespeare. We were doing measure for measure, and I had grown my beard out. I decided one of my characters had this big beard. So I, I had, it was in pretty good shape. Uh, and an audition came across. They wanted me to do a self tape at home um, for an audition for this show called, this short film called Frank and Emmett. I read the script and immediately identified with this guy. I just knew this guy, I knew who he was. Um, and fell in love with the uh, the piece and sent in the audition and told my manager, I said, I want this. I really want this. This is, I, I want this piece. And um, I got a call a week later, uh, an, an email that they wanted me to do a callback with the director uh, on Zoom. So I said, yeah, I'm in. Let's do it. So I worked on the lines. Um, and it was just me and, and him. And he was doing the, the lines for the other character. Quickly, so people understand what the heck we're talking about. It's um, a man talking to a partner of like 40, 45 years. Been, a, been an, uh, uh, an act together for all those years. And he's telling, revealing some things to his partner that the partner didn't know. Uh, number one, that the that the uh, act is breaking up, and number two, that his partner is a puppet, which was a shock to the puppet. Um, and I fell in love with the piece. It was written and directed by the. Uh, the guy who was the head of animation for uh, Trolls 2 at DreamWorks. He's an animator and, and, uh, uh, at DreamWorks, but he's always loved the Muppets. And this is more or less an homage to the, uh, to the older guys who have been working uh, those puppets, uh, those Muppets for all those years. And um, we worked together that time. Then we had another call back, and he, he, he said, I want to tell you, his name is Carlos. Carlos is originally from Spain. He said, I wanted to tell you that this isn't really a callback. I knew I wanted you from the first audition, but they want me to make sure that I see a couple of other people too. But yeah, I just want you to know that you are Frank. So I said, cool. Brilliant. And then... Uh, we worked, uh, we worked on Zoom Oh, because we couldn't uh, work in person. We worked on Zoom for about a month, month and a half. We met a couple of times a week, um, uh, refining the script and whatnot and talking about the characters. And um, each time there was a point when I got into the piece, where I couldn't, I had a very difficult time holding it together. Mm -hmm. I came close to, uh, to 
to losing it because I identified with the guy. It's so much more than just, it's not just, a, there's humor in it, mm -hmm. but it's a lot deeper than that. It means it's about a lot more things than just a team breaking up. Um, so we worked on it and then we were supposed to shoot in uh, July, end of July. And then we got pushed back because of COVID. Going to work in August. Had the date set. Got pushed again because of COVID. Finally, in October, we we filmed it. COVID protocols were really good. Everybody was very safe. Um, it was just myself and the uh, puppet. There were two guys operating the puppet. They both worked uh, for uh, uh, Henson. The Henson Company, so they'd worked on the Muppets. They'd worked on uh, the uh, the new Muppet Show. Brian Jones is the guy who does uh, the bulk of the work on uh, on on Emmett, and he was brilliant. And then they brought in this little ten-year-old girl who sounds like she's eight to play my granddaughter, who sings at the end of the piece. And every time she sang, I would it brought me to tears. <laughs> um, so it was. It was a beautiful project. We've been making the, the festival circuit. That's why it's not out uh, yet. Uh, we are in another festival this week, no, in first week in June here in LA. We have uh, one best short narrative, best family film. Uh, we've, we've won several different things in like five or six different ones, different festivals. And we are now Oscar qualified. Um, which means that next year we can be nominated for an Oscar. Extraordinary. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's because I don't count any of those chickens. But, you know, um, the fact that such a small production got to that point at, during the pandemic, no less. Yeah. Extraordinary. And it was shot in, in his bedroom. Ah, okay. We extended the bed, added a, a platform at the bottom of the bed, drilled a hole through, <laughs> through the, the wood right. so the puppet could come up and talk to me. Um, yeah, and, and, and so it, it's beautifully, beautifully shot. Um, I'm really proud of it because it's just one of those pieces that's just, it's about something. It's simple, it's sweet. And, uh, and I was really lucky to be part of it. Well, I, I also read maybe I read too much into it. I, I read themes of mortality and immortality. Oh, um, I, I read themes of, um, you know, uh, of passing on things to the next generation that are important to you. Um, and, uh, and, and on many levels, I'm not just talking about, you know, Frank, ultimately, I'm also talking about the whole concept you said that the some of the puppeteers you know are related to muppet work and so on that's something from a cultural standpoint that's been passed to a couple of generations now yep um and so it hit me on many levels as someone who grew up with sesame street and the muppets from another generation <laughs> you know yeah. um it, it it was it was uh very interesting to me in that way but uh and you mentioned the uh, the young actor singing at the end and that was very resonant and uh, i love how it doesn't say everything straight out right it, it, it lets you imply and infer things um but it really felt like it did it in a gentle wonderful way it wasn't like suddenly this happens you know and sometimes i think right. it's a little too much sometimes yeah. you have to just let the audience absorb and sit with something and after I watched it, I did sit with it for a few minutes to really let it kind of settle in. And like the scene I told you earlier in, in For All Mankind, that's to me some of the most effective pieces in, in acting and, and film is when you watch something and you go, gosh, wait a minute, I can't, I don't want to go do something else yet. I want to sit here and think about it and let myself feel how I'm feeling about it and then move forward from there. And th this piece definitely did that. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm 100%. He, he didn't believe in hitting anybody over the head. Uh, one of the things that I hate in movies and especially TV shows or stage is when I, I went to see a, a friend uh, do a, a fellow Transformer do a reading of a, a, a play and 
if I hear actors, me- I mean, author's message, author's message, author's message, <laughs> turns me off. Right, you know, right. let, let me let me find it. Right. You know, uh, give me enough credit as a as a, a breathing human being. It, it, uh, the way media know, works now, there's going to be 20 think pieces on the thing after the fact. <laughs> so you'll get all the analysis <laughs> you need. You know? I, I, I mean, I go see movies or watch TV shows sometimes, and I know I miss something. So sometimes I'll occasionally Google, like, what did I miss? You know, what is this theme or whatever in this show or movie? And then an article will explain it to me. I'll say, oh, okay, okay, I get it now. I, okay. I admit, I don't always get it. But uh, sometimes also I think there's value in, even if the uh, creator didn't intend something, you can still sometimes get something out of it that maybe they didn't realize they were creating. And I think there's Listen, value. Yeah, I've written pieces where uh, I'll, I'll get feedback and it's like, wow, I'm deeper than I thought I was. <laughs> I didn't Go me. That, I didn't know that I, I meant that. It's like, wow, that's true. You know, yeah, but, but you're absolutely right. You know, it's like there, there may be something there that the, the author didn't intend but it's there, yeah. Whether they knew it or not, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that was uh, that. That oh, I was curious though. Was the voice? Did you get to meet or work with the voice actor who did the voice of the puppet, or were you always? Separate? He was. He was in the room with me. Oh, he, he was in the room. The bed. Okay. okay. Great. We, oh yeah, he was doing the voice and uh, moving the puppet. Wonderful. Uh, and what, what was funny is that after we were uh, uh, they, because they cast. They cast him first. They needed the, somebody to be who knew how to operate the puppet first. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when they, uh, Carlos, uh, when he looked me up on IMDb, he said, you could have done the voice. <laughs> I didn't realize that. I, you, you, it, 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 you. And I said, yeah, but, but the way you shot it, it would be really difficult. I'd have to do everything in post. Right. Um, and he said, yeah, you, you, you know, and he's like, yeah, okay. Uh, he said, I had no idea because he didn't know who I was. I was just a guy auditioning for it. Oh, um, and, and of course, but you saw the beard. Yes. So by the time we finally shot, my beard was, was pretty wild. Right. Right. Which is what he wanted because that's. Oh, okay. Yeah. They, they said somebody with a big beard. So it's like, hire the beard. Well, there's a line about it too. So I think yeah. that, that explains that. I wondered right. if they worked that in because you had the beard first. Oh, that was already in the script. Oh, that was already in there. Okay. So so that that's Frank and Abbott. But what else do you have going on? I know I know you've got at least one or two things going on with an NDA. That's fine. <laughs> but I'm uh where should fans be looking towards for your work? Uh, uh yes. Um I can say games. Uh there are a couple of games that I can't talk about. Um, let's see what else have I got. Uh, you know, something that I started doing that I've during the pandemic that I never cared to do before, um, but I could do them here from my house. Uh, and I'd asked, been asked several times, I said, nah, no, but um, uh, and I'm doing a couple of series, um. But you'll never hear me if you like listening to things in the their na- native language. I've been doing a lot of Netflix um, dubbing, in- ah, dubbing into English. Oh, okay. A couple of, a couple of different series from. Uh, well, I can talk about one because it's already been out, and we just watched it. We, we watched it in French, uh, but it's a gr- it's a wonderful series. You, you should check it out, not to, to listen to me, uh, but to to. Uh, to watch it in French, it's called uh, The Seven Lives of Leah, L-E-A. Okay. It's really fascinating. It's a young girl who, um, who is out at a party outside and she stumbles across, uh, upon a, a skeleton. Hmm. And they track down and find out who the skeleton belonged to. She goes to sleep that night and she wakes up in the body of the person who died. Oh, wow. In 1991. Huh. And it's like, whoa, what, where am I? She <laughs> looks at herself in the mirror and realizes that she is the guy that, okay, so it's basically a mystery. And then each night she go, goes to sleep, she wakes up in the body of someone else oh. involved in the mystery. 
Wow. It's really that sounds right up my alley, actually. It's It's a crime, kind of supernatural, right? That that's interesting. Uh, and it's season one. Okay. So it looks like there's there may be a season two. And you you have one voice in there, several voices? I I did uh, one, two. I think four different voices. Okay. In it. Cool. Some of them may be coming back in season two, but uh, listen to it in French. Uh, it's 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 real an interesting piece. Seven Lives of Leah. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it's really good. Okay, and you have games coming out. I I yeah, games coming out. Um, uh, I'm doing I'm doing some some readings uh, here in town. Uh, but the, most of the stuff I can't talk about. Well, you know what? Let's. I got a wedding coming up. Oh, well, hey, that's right. Yes, you do. Congratulations. My daughter, uh, I've joked about this before. I have two daughters who've never played any games that I've ever done. Uh, <laughs> but both their, uh, all the guys they've ever dated, right. all have. <laughs> and my soon-to-be son-in-law, uh, is not only is he a wonderful actor, he's way too good looking um, <laughs> and a wonderful singer, but he's a huge nerd he's a huge gamer um and uh, for my birthday this year he and my other daughter's boyfriend made me sit down and watch them play uh some metal gear solid <laughs> made me listen to uh, the, watch the the cut scenes and listen to my voice we had a great time you know what paul i'm going to put this out in the universe right now there's a fallout live action series being produced i want to see you get a cameo on that uh, there's rumors of a Metal Gear remaster or something like that. I would love them to pull you in for something for that. that that's not a confirmation of anything, folks. That's Ben Yee putting a wish list out into the universe. And I like your wish list. <laughs> All right. Well, Paul, this has been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for all your value, valuable time and insights. Um, I really treasure time like this. So very much appreciated. Ben, it's, it, it truly has been my pleasure, man. It's like talking to an old friend. We've known each other since 2010. Yeah, yeah. Right? Let's not think about those numbers too long. Right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, man. It's been a pleasure. Right. Great talking. Take care. Love everybody. Bye-bye. Be well. And that was part two of my interview with Paul Eiding. Once again, I offer my sincerest thanks to Paul for taking time out of his busy schedule to speak with me. Check out the description below to find links where you can follow Paul online and find out about his upcoming projects. Thank you for watching. Likes and kind comments are always appreciated. If you like what I do on this channel, please consider subscribing. For now, may your luster never dull and your wires never cross.